Let's bow our heads for a moment. Lord, as we open your word together, I pray that your spirit would open our hearts and help us hear from you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 10. Beginning in verse 25. Luke 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I, I've been curious whether this testing was an antagonistic testing or a curiosity testing, uh, trying to affirm what he's already heard. I don't really know what his motive was other than there's a element of testing in it. He said to him, Jesus says to him, what's written in the law? What is your reading of it? The question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, how do you read the scripture? What do you hear it saying? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. It's the same answer Jesus gave to the same basic question to someone else on another occasion. He's got the right words. He's got the right words. Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who's my neighbor? Why would he want to justify himself? Well, he felt a little awkward at that moment because he just answered the question he asked. So why do he ask the question if you know the answer already? It's a awkward. So he dove into one of their common questions of the day. Who's my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And, and the, the general consensus was friends, family, and a little bit beyond that, you might extend neighbor. Uh, but not very far, certainly not to pagans and Romans and Greeks and barbarians and uh, no, no, definitely not them, definitely not them. The, 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 the Gentiles, no. So Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, the one that a Jew would never help because he's outside the bounds of what God asks us to help. He's, 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 he's done, he's gone, has no value in God's sight, in their opinion. Jesus turns that one around and makes him the hero of the story. And it was a real incident that it actually happened that they knew about. And at the end, when Jesus said, so which one do you think was neighbor to the fellow who fell among thieves? And the lawyer couldn't even say the Samaritan. He said, uh, the guy who had mercy on him. The guy who had mercy on him. He had the words. But I think there was something else besides looking kind of dumb because you answered your own question. I think he probably had something going on in his head a little bit like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, what do I need to do? Jesus recited some of the commandments and he said, I've done that all my life. Jesus says, yeah, what you need you need to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. It's interesting Jesus never said that to anybody else. But he did to that one man. Because that was what he needed to do. For him, covetousness about his things and his money and his wealth, clinging to that was the thing that was destroying him. It was the lead weight taking him down.
got to be careful about those lead weights. They can kill you. Fisherman back in the Midwest, I think it was Wisconsin, when he threw his anchor overboard so he could fish, had his leg tangled in the rope without realizing it. <laughs> Pulled him over halfway between the top and the bottom. That was it. Man, be careful about those weights. The rich young ruler had his leg tied tight to the anchor rope. He needed to let go of that thing. It's going to kill him. It's going to kill him. And the rich young ruler wasn't the only one who felt some lack. I think the lawyer here did. Because although on the outside, his life looked like God's law asked for, he was not entirely comfortable with where he was. Something in him was saying, hmm, it's not quite right. I don't know if you get that feeling. I do. I do. My grandma could look at me and say, you got your act together, Jim. I'm so glad you're not like your cousin. <laughs> Who did not have his life together. And she knew that. <laughs> But I was a mess inside. It wasn't where grandma could see, but I was a mess inside. And this lawyer, hmm, something's been playing. Well, I shouldn't say playing, working. <laughs> working on his heart and his mind. Something's not quite right. What's off? What's off? What's off? Well, for him, it was a lot like what uh, 1 John 2 tells us. 1 John chapter 2. Beginning in verse 9 through verse 11. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness until now. Never been out of the darkness. <laughs> he who loves his brother abides in the light, stays there, remains there, lives there, continuously there. Never got out of the darkness, never leaves the light. What's the question, the, the difference? Do you love your brother? Do you not love your brother? But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. A relationship with other people. <laughs> Man's inhumanity to man is one of the greatest evils in our world. And we see it. It's alive and well today. It takes a lot of forms. When I go out in my backyard and turn a stone over, sometimes I unearth a nest of termites, little bitty termites. Now, fortunately, the little bitty termites are the guys who eat little bits of your house kind of slowly, and they don't take the whole thing down in a few months. But still, you know, it's not a great thing to find a nest of termites in your backyard. I mean, they're all over. You can't avoid having some around. But the lawyer probably had the feeling that when you turned over the stones in the backyard of his soul, sometimes some stuff come up and say, ooh, we'll just pretend we didn't see that. That's not cool. Not good. Not good. You ever have feelings less than God's perfect love toward another human being? Yeah, I do. 
Not that I want to, but I do. Not that I should, but I do. Where did hatred originate? Lucifer. Lucifer. Beautiful angel served in the presence of God, created perfect. The pipes were specially prepared for him. He could sing. I had a friend once who could whistle two-part harmony with himself. Yeah. Two tones at the same time. He'd whistle. Both sides of his mouth at the same time. We worked the evening shift at the gas station at PUC. We were the guys that closed up. We were the only ones there half the evening. He'd be whistling away out in there, mopping the floors. How do you do that? Uh, I, I am given to understand that Lucifer could sing for a part harmony with himself. Now that is cool. I'm challenged with one. <laughs> one. But out of that heart so blessed and capable and endowed by God turned in on itself man they never should have given him a mirror should they oh well, maybe it wasn't a mirror <laughs> some thoughts <laughs> thinking about himself came proud and he wanted more came to the point that he was willing to kill God to have his spot and did. The Bible says a single spring cannot give forth good water and bad. It's good or it's bad. If you mix poisonous water with good water, how diluted does it need to be before you're comfortable drinking it? Well, it depends on how it's presented to you because sometimes we swallow the whole thing just because the label says, this is what you want. And it sounds like what we're listening for and we just drink it up, not realizing Man, that stuff's toxic. It will kill you. It will kill you. The devil's in the business of trying to kill us all. He'll do it literally, physically. But ultimately, he wants to destroy us spiritually. Separate us from God. Ecclesiastes 10.1. Ecclesiastes 10.1, dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. A little evil spoils a lot of good. It could be one dead fly that dropped in to the perfumer's pot. And if it hadn't been for the one fly, that was going to be perfume. And it was well on its way to smelling sweet, lovely, attractive. One dead fly, and the whole thing turns over chemically. Whew. I don't know exactly what spoiled perfume smells like, but I have a couple of things that come to mind as possibilities. Dead fish and dead frogs. <laughs> dead stuff can smell awful. Can smell awful. So a spring with a little bit of poison in it, it's toxic. Our hearts, with a dead fly here, termites under the rock there. 
It's not good. It's not good. What's our natural self in our heart spiritually? The natural heart receives not the things of God. Neither indeed can it. Can't do it. It's got to be an act of grace on God's part to resolve that for us. I think it would be fair to say from what the scripture says, we are all a little bit leprous. Little bit of leprosy. Now we'd say little bit leprous. But what happens if you're a little bit leprous? You're leprous. And the fact that you are not as deformed as the other leper over there yet doesn't mean you don't have as bad a problem as the leper over there has. They just had time to show it. I haven't. Being a little bit leprous is not okay. It's going to kill us. But that's our natural self. And the devil works hard to keep any piece he can under any rock anywhere in our soul going so that we will not be cured of leprosy spiritually. He wants us dead. He's working hard to make that work. But God is working harder to save us. So how deep is the pit of sin from which, in which we are trapped? How deep? Well, when someone has been rescued, falling down a well in a cave, something of that sort. You can tell how far down they were by how much rope it took to pull them out. Pretty easy. When Jesus came down from heaven to this earth and died for us, where did he start out at? The throne of God. The highest place you can be in the universe. Where did he end up when he died for us? The lowest spot of hell. Reserved for the devil and his angels. The second death from which you don't come back. That's where he was willing to go. He went from the very, very top to the very, very bottom. They used all the rope, the whole thing. It's a long rope. It's a long ways down from there to here. But that's what he was willing to do for us. To save us from the sin in which we are trapped. He crushed his life. We hang on to it, it'll crush us too. You can't stay a little bit leprous. It will spread. If it's any bit leprous, it will destroy you. We need to be completely cleansed by the grace of God, completely cleansed. When Jesus' life was crushed out on Calvary, it was a turning point for our universe. Up to that point, even some of the loyal angels in heaven who had stuck with God didn't realize how bad sin was. Didn't realize how far the devil would go didn't know how evil and destructive it was. It was hidden well. Nice label. Good posters. It looked nice most of the time. Just trying to fix things, make them a little bit better, have the freedom God's given us. Those were his, his advertising points. He makes it sound good.
And the devil was hoping to get a chance to kill Jesus. He tried through Herod. He tried through the Jewish leaders a number of times. He tried with the crowds that tried to stone him. And on Calvary, he succeeded. He got him. Killed him. He killed his creator. The rest of the universe looking at that said, really? Really? Have you no sense? I mean, what do you think keeps you alive? Fool. Fool. When I was in academy, one of my friends had a little toy that looked like a coffin. It had a little on-off switch on the front. And if you turned it on, the lid would come up, hand would come out, flip it off, the lid goes back down. It couldn't turn itself on, but it could turn itself off. The devil couldn't really be God, and he couldn't keep life going, but he could cut it off. He could cut it off. He could kill God. And when he got a chance, he did. And at that moment, he lost all sympathy in the rest of the universe. If it wasn't for sinners on this earth, nobody's on his side anymore. His demons and sinners here, he still gets some support. But the rest of the universe knows it's a dead end street with him. The day that he killed Jesus, he lost all remaining sympathy in the rest of the universe. That's actually a good thing. That needed to happen before God could end the mess of sin down here. It needs to do some of the same thing in our hearts still, working on that, working on that. When Jesus died and was put in the grave, the devil dared to hope to keep him there forever. Because if he can keep him there forever, he wins. He doesn't come to a termination point. And so he was very eager and earnest to keep Jesus in the tomb. Now, when one of us dies and is buried, okay, someday I'm going to die. Somebody's going to bury me. Uh, and when I am dead and buried, what does it take to keep me in the grave? <laughs> it's not very hard. In fact, you can do nothing. And I'll just stay right there. Just stay right there. Because I'm dead. The dead know nothing. The dead don't know they're dead. The dead don't know they were ever alive. The dead know nothing and can do nothing and have no more apart forever than anything that happens under the sun till the end and the resurrection. We do work sometimes to keep other live people out of that grave. Grave robbers is a thing. People, Burying yourself with treasure is a thing. I guess it makes no sense to me. I'm, I'm going to probably be cremated. I'm going to be a box of ashes there, right? What do I care about anything you want to bury with me? I will not care. I will not use it. Not because I, well, not because I now don't want to use it, but because then I can't want, can't think. No thoughts, no nothing. I will not need anything. But others might want what you bear with me. So we take precautions to keep predators out of the, the tomb. Uh, not because the dead person's going to get out. The scripture says a live dog is better than a dead lion. <laughs> dead lion can't do anything. Now, the, the lion, when alive, is the king of beasts. 
And the dog was one of the most despised animals in the world to the Jews. Ugh. Dogs. That's like Gentiles. <laughs> well, wait, those are people, our brothers. <laughs> we got a problem there. But they didn't think they had a problem there. And so, when the devil inspired the Jewish leaders with the reminder that Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified and rise on the third day. They'd heard that report that he'd said that. It came back to them. They remembered that when the disciples didn't. When Jesus died, it all went to a gray fog in the head of the disciples. We thought it was him. We, we, we really thought it was him. But he's dead. So it can't be him. It can't be him. In, in their way of putting prophetic scenario together, that wasn't possible. It was what God had asked for. Jesus a number of times said, so how else is scripture going to be fulfilled? Unless we do this. But they didn't get that. So when the Jewish leaders went to Pilate and said, uh, well, he was still alive. He did say um, something about uh, coming back to life on the third day. And we think it would be a really kind of a, an unfortunate occurrence. If his disciples stole his body and made it look like he actually was raised from the dead. Oh, I, we think you understand that that would be a problem. Yeah, he understood that would be a problem. A problem to all of them. So he said, yep, I am more than happy to give you a guard. So they got a hundred soldiers. And they went out personally and made sure that the stone was well placed and sealed with ropes to keep it from moving, which was sealed with a seal to prevent tampering without evidence. And a hundred Roman soldiers. Now, how many of those hundred Roman soldiers do you think slept that night? What was their job? Guard the tomb. When soldiers are given a task to guard something overnight, what do they do? They guard it overnight. They don't sleep. They stay awake. That's their job. What happened in those days, and even up into our own times, if you were a soldier pulling sentry duty, and you were sleeping at your post, what could happen to you? Death penalty. You don't, do, you don't ever do that. But they didn't. They didn't. If one of them looked like he was getting a little, the other guy's like, hey, Joe, knock that off. <laughs> you want to see another sunrise? Well, okay, another sunset? Tomorrow's sunset? Eh, no, no, don't be sleeping. No joke, no. None of them, none of them slept. What they didn't see was the host of evil angels there to help them keep them in the tomb. And the host of holy angels around, guarding that same tomb. I think it was probably a pretty quiet Sabbath in heaven that weekend. Jesus was dead. The devil actually got him actually got him. What's next? Sunday morning. Not even bright and early. Earlier than bright and early. Still dark. But it was Sunday morning. And the angel who took Lucifer's place in heaven, the only other named angel in heaven in the scripture is Gabriel. Probably Gabriel came down in full glory. He, he was equipped for his task for the day with a load of glory sufficient that the evil angels all fled. And the Roman guards all fell down like dead men. And, and gazed incredulously 
as this brilliant being came down, pushed that rock away like it was nothing, and said, your father calls you. And the one they had mocked, and on whom they had put a crown of thorns, came out of the grave, clearly alive and divine. Not a good moment for those soldiers. They were the guys that mocked him. They were the guys that spit on him. They were the guys that smacked him. They were the guys that whipped him. They were the guys that did all of that. And he's the king of the universe. <sighs> Little low, slow coming to understand that, aren't you? Yeah, they were. But they got it. They got it. First Corinthians chapter 15. I like first Corinthians 15. I, I think if I had to be lost on a desert, deserted island somewhere, and I could have one chapter of scripture, one chapter only, it might be 1 Corinthians 15. It might be, because it's kind of got the whole thing in there. Kind of got it in there. I delivered to you, verse 3, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. After that, he was seen by Cephas, Peter, then by the twelve. Interesting to me, the Bible tells of a couple of other people that are not in his list that saw Jesus, even that first day. The two on the road to Emmaus also saw Jesus. When they got back to Jerusalem where the disciples were at the upper room with the news, we walked with him on the road. Our hearts were burning in us when he talked, but we didn't catch on. We, we didn't recognize him until we sat down to eat, saw his hands, and the way he prayed for the bread. And when they got back, the disciples said, he's appeared to Peter. Peter's seen him. So this is Peter, having seen him that first day. Then by the 12th, so over the next several weeks, Thomas was the one that got left out the first round and said, nah, I'm not believing until I touch his side and, and uh, see him for myself. But eventually even Thomas saw and believed. And Jesus had an interesting lesson to Thomas. He said, so you've seen and you're believed, that's good. You know, there's a lot of people going to come to faith in me. They're never going to see that. Like all of us. Centuries, millennia of believers who have not seen the hands and the feet, haven't touched Jesus after his resurrection. We got to take their testimony because we can't see him directly ourselves. And Jesus said to Thomas, Bless, blessing on those who don't require. See, you, you needed it and you saw it and that's good. But there's a blessing for those who believe without that direct physical evidence. Then he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, that was, that was the appointment in Galilee that Jesus had made before his death, which they figured was off because he was dead. But one of the first things the angels said to the women, tell his disciples he's going to meet you in Galilee. Remember, you got an appointment with him. Don't skip the doctor's appointment. <laughs> right? He made an appointment with you. Be there. He meant it. He's going to be there. He's going to be there. And then he was seen by James. 
This is probably Jesus' brother, James, who becomes leader of the church later in the book of Acts. Has not been a full believer. At a minimum, he wasn't a full believer. Whether he believed at all, we don't know for sure. But Jesus made a special point to go see his brother. Special point. And it worked. He came around to believe and be a strength to the cause of God. He is alive. He is not in the tomb. He came out of the tomb as a conqueror. He died a bit of a conqueror. He had conquered the forces of evil with his death. But now he conquered death itself. And, and Paul says uh, in, in verses 12 and on, so how is it that some of you are saying there's no resurrection of the dead? We've been preaching about Jesus being raised. So there is resurrection from the dead. Because if it wasn't resurrection from the dead, then Jesus wouldn't be raised. And if Jesus isn't raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Wasn't his death enough to pay for our sins? On the legal account of death, uh, of debt for sin, the death of Jesus paid the debt. <clears throat> but in the tabernacle temple service, it isn't just the death of the sacrifice animal that cleanses the record of your life of sin. It's the blood from the sacrifice taken into the tabernacle and applied there that cleanses from sin. You need a priest to do that. Who's the priest that serves the blood of the sacrifice of Jesus on our account in heaven? Jesus is the priest that makes it happen for us. If he stays in the grave, you paid the price but it doesn't get applied. That's an interesting spot to get stuck in. I'm glad we didn't get stuck in that one. Because <laughs> Paul says your faith is futile if he didn't come out of the grave. Your faith is futile. But our faith is not futile. He goes on to say, but now is Christ risen from the grave. The first fruits of them that slept. And he's the first fruits that guarantees the harvest that comes after. What's the harvest that comes after? That's us. That's us. All God's people. All God's people. And I think most of God's people will have died and been buried at some point and be raised when he comes. There's some alive. But an awful lot have died. Awful lot have died. Uh, and so, he's the guarantee that that's going to happen. His resurrection says it all worked. It's all good. Uh, and it also says, Romans 8, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. In us. So that all of those termites under the rocks, all of those shadows in the corners of our soul can be cleansed. And we can live a life like Jesus lived. That can be us. That can be us. How did God do that? By sending Jesus to do what the law couldn't do because it was weak through the flesh. What's he trying to do? Get the law to be lived in us. 
But because we are sinners and the flesh is weak, that doesn't always happen. But Jesus came to make it happen. To condemn sin in the flesh and let righteousness live in our hearts. By God's grace. So what can the flesh not do? The law not do because of the weakness of the flesh? Can't make us righteous. Can't make us holy. Can't make us obey God's law all the time. From the heart. <laughs> not from the outside where the lawyer was. Where the rich young ruler was. But from down inside where the motives are. And the thoughts are. And the intentions are. The whole thing needs to be clean. That takes the grace of God. That takes a savior in whom we live and who lives in us to make that happen. Psalm 22, there are quotations from the cross. It starts out with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he talks about the bulls of Bajan surrounding him and the words of the crowd around. If God wants him so bad, let him take him. He can have him. The quotations, direct, exact quotations from what happened around the cross in Psalm 22 are astonishing. Psalm 23, dead, buried, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, Jesus in the grave. And Psalm 24, the ascension. And he arrives at the gates of heaven, having risen from the grave, a victor. He goes back to heaven. And at the gates, the, the, the angels escorting him up say, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory will come in. And from the walls, the other angels say, who is this king of glory? And the answer is, the Lord, all capitals. What does that mean? I just caught that this week. Yahweh, Jehovah God, the one who comes back as the victor over the grave and stands at the gates of heaven to be let in is none other than God himself who died for us. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh, the victor, is the king of glory. Open those doors and let us in. And they opened those doors and he went in an everlasting conqueror. Amen. And amen. Are you longing for forgiveness? Do you want cleansing from sin? Do you want a pure heart? Man, I want that. <laughs> I've wanted it for a long time, and God's made a lot of progress on it. And I still want it, and I still need it. Do you want a heart of flesh? And there's, there's some rocky parts in my heart still. I can tell by the tinky sound. It's rock. It's not flesh. Some of it sounds a little harder than caliche, too. I don't know, maybe granite. Would you like Jesus to live his life in you? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, then right now ask him to do that. Ask him to do that.